I'm a managing security consultant at NCC Group. Um, Ex-software developer, I used to develop all kinds of software from desktop software to web to games and even some factory machines. Um, I think of myself as a as a hacker, breaker. I like to I like to break stuff, build stuff to break stuff, solve problems. Outside of work and technology and all this kind of stuff, I'm a hiker and rock climber, and I am next to DB on the internet, Twitter and what have you. So. First thing, hands up if you would know what to do if you saw this packet during a pen test. Sweet, well done. Cool. So, we start off with a story. I went to a customer site to assess a web application. Except when I got there, they told me I need a specific old version of Java. That's a bit strange, it's a web app, surely. Right. Why, would, why do we need that? So I thought maybe it's um, a Java client application that communicates over HTTP. So I started to build a VM and I started to poke around with this application. Uh, and I noticed that the application eventually responded to um, just a test login request with um, something saying that the account was locked out. I thought that's strange because I haven't seen any requests go through Web Suite. Um, so, fired up Wireshark, see what was going on. Um, and it turns out that it was just a Java application served by a HTTP page. So it was, it was a Java web start application, so it was actually just a, like a, a thick client application. Um, and with Wireshark running, uh, I, I generated some login requests and I saw a packet like for each login request, the packet like the one that I just showed you. Um, so it was a, a login packet, like I say, um, and that led to the discovery of a vulnerability that had survived multiple previous pen tests. Every time a new version of this application was rolled out in the, on the network, they had it pen tested. Um, it gave me a, a foothold on a server that had a hard exterior, but it was tough inside. Got root on that server, and from there, I was able to jump around the entire environment um, from pre production to production. I was in at least three different data centers. So, I would have missed that vulnerability as well as all of the previous pen testers. Um, but I've done a lot of research into um, Java deserialization stuff. Um, so, as soon as I saw that packet, I, I recognised that I knew what to do. And I've been talking about this today. Everyone in this industry needs to be learning constantly. So the point of this talk is to look at these kind of, uh, look at how we can identify these kind of vulnerabilities or potential entry points and how we can then attack them using existing tools. So the first thing to point out is that um, Practical doesn't mean point and click. Uh, generally, these kind of attacks are a bit more involved, um, but I, I would put that I, I would put that in line with sort of manual SQL injection. You might have to poke around a bit more, tweak your query a bit more, try and bypass some filters, um, but they are rewarding. These kind of vulnerabilities generally um, get you command execution on a box, so it's worth doing. So we need to understand how serialization works and how these kind of vulnerabilities can be, uh, um, can be identified and, and attacked in order to, to do it effectively. So we'll start off with some background. So serialization the process is, is the process of converting runtime variables and program objects that are in memory into a form that can be stored on the disk or in a database or transferred over the network. Um, reverse process deserialization takes that data and turns it back into runtime objects and variables. Um, the more complex the runtime data structures are, so object-oriented programming languages have objects embedded within objects, the more complex the serialization um, format and process has to be. 
and the more complex that that format is and that process is, the more scope there is for vulnerabilities. Uh, there is no fixed format for serialised data. It can be a custom format, it can be a built-in format that, 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 that's provided as part of the programming language or APIs, standard APIs that you use, JSON, XML. Um, generally, built-in formats are, are, are easier to use, you don't have to do anything to, 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 to use them. Um, so, I'm focusing on Java for this talk, uh, but the same high-level concepts do apply to, to other languages and technologies, for, for example PHP. Um, like I say, the built-in serialization is easy to use, so in Java, we have, in order to make our Java class serializable, we just implement the interface java.io.serializable. Once we've done that, we can pass an instance of that object, a runtime object, to an object output stream and we can write it to a file, to a network, over a network connection, so on. To read that back, we use an object input stream and we can read that data back. This, that's all there is to it. It's really easy to use. Um, the actual data format it can be described as a simple stream format. Um, so each stream starts with a two byte magic number. That's followed by a two byte version number. I've only ever seen version five. Um, I'm sure there's, there's, there's older versions that exist and in the future newer versions could exist. And that header is followed by at least one content element. And the reason it's a stream format is that there can be multiple content elements and you just read and read and read until the end of the stream so there's no more data. Um, so that content element will, will begin with a byte in the range hex 70 to hex 70. Um, so for example, 0x70 is null, an object is 73, array 75 and so on. Um, the actual specification can be found online on the Oracle website, um, but it's a bit unclear in places. So some examples, just to show you what serialization data looks like, or serialized data looks like. Um, so a minimal stream, like I say, you've got the two bytes ACED, the header, the magic number, um, the version number 0005, and then 70, which is a null element. The string four A's, Again, you've got the header, you've got 74, which is a string. 0004 is a two byte length field, which tells us how long the string is, and then we've got the actual bytes of the string. And then this is a basic object. Um, that bit of code there should actually implement serializable, but that's a, a simple object. So we've got 73, uh, offset 4 is the, it tells us this is an object. 72, this is a class description, and then we've got the rest of the the data for that class, so the length of the class name, the actual class name, and so on. Deserialization in Java is done using the object input stream. Um, that passes data sequentially, so it reads through the stream, tries to instantiate some element, uh, some content element, gets the next one after that, and, and so on. Um, what I didn't say a minute ago was that the first byte of a content element that tells us the type, whether it's null, string, so on, that also tells us the format of the data that follows for that element. So like I said, in a string, you've got a length field and then you've got the actual string. Then you can have additional content elements. Um, data is inst instantiated as it is read. It's, it's instantly instantiated. So there's an object, an, object, eh, an object in the stream. The data for that object is read into memory, turned into an object, and then Java will ca carry on reading from the stream, if requested. Um, and there isn't much validation performed, if any, really. Um, so, for example, here we're reading, we're, we're calling object input stream that read objects to read an object from a serialization stream. We then cast it to a string and, a, 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 and assign that string to the, to the variable s. The validation kind of happens there. If the object that we read from the stream isn't 
compatible, type compatible with string, then an exception will be thrown, and that's kind of your, your validation. Um, so you, you, a, a program should handle that exception and go, right, that data is not how we expected it to be, and chuck it away or whatever. Um, while the serialization, serialization is happening, well, uh, the deserialization, sorry, Java doesn't care. Java's going to read an object from the stream, instantiate it, and then return it. At that point, it's too late. And we'll get to that. Um, so, if a class implements the serializable interface, it can also implement a read object method. That method can be used in place of or in conjunction with Java's default read objects, um, uh, Java's default method of reading objects. So you can read custom data, you can have, say, a version number in the stream so that you're compatible with, you can have a newer version of your software compatible with older versions of data. Um, but we can also use that read object method to sort of handle the, the, the event that an object is loaded. Um, so a daft example of that is you might have a, uh, a class that manages your database connection. When you serialize that class, it might write the data database connection parameters to a file using serialization. And then when you read those back, it might automatically reconnect to the database. So that's how we might handle um, the, the object loaded event. So deserialization vulnerability. These occur when we, as an attacker, have control of the data that's being deserialized. By controlling that data, we control the properties of objects that are being instantiated in memory, including the type of the object. So that example where we cast something to a string, we don't have to have a string in the stream there. An exception will be thrown, but by that point, an object has already been instantiated. Um, by controlling data, we can control code flow that depends on that data. Um, and that includes any code that's in a serializable class's read object method that handles the object loaded event, and any interaction with an object that's been loaded or been read from a serialization stream. So if, if code calls read object and then interacts with the result, again, we can manipulate that code using the properties of the object. Um, so this is called property-oriented programming. Um, we control properties of objects to influence the flow of code execution. Uh, payload, like I say, controls. Uh, so, so code that we control through controlling properties of an object is, is called a pop gadget. Um, we can think of that as a high-level ROP gadget, uh, except uh, a, a ROP gadget might just push a, a, a value onto the stack. A POP gadget might uh, write some data to a file, for example, so it's much much higher level. And generally, exploitation relies on, uh, so, sorry, exploitation relies on knowledge of the source code, so we need to know what code is executing when our object is instantiated in order to be able to manipulate it. Um, this seems to be a point of confusion when it comes to this kind of stuff. Um, it's a, it's sort of a, a memory corruption exploit. You, kinda, you tend to be sending some kind of code to the application that, and it's going to eventually e execute that code. In a deserialization exploit, we're sending properties and we're manipulating code that already exists. It's not always possible to acquire application source code. So how do we attack an application without source code? Now anyone that's done any of this kind of stuff before or read any, anything about this kind of stuff should have heard of Wessel Serial. Um, and so, so Wessel Serial, essentially these uh, uh, various researchers went and looked at all of these libraries and some more, and basically said, right, what code is there that we can manipulate in, to do something useful to an attacker? And built a load of 
pop gadget chains and publish them uh, in, in, in a tool, Wasl Serial, which, which generates these chains and generates these payloads. Um, most of these payloads enable us to execute commands blindly, so we don't get anything back from those commands unless the command will do something so like we can ping ourselves, but we won't get output from the ping command. So how do we attack Java deserialization? There are three key parts to a serialization attack. First part is an entry point. Second part is some gadgets, so why so serial? Um, and then actual commands to execute against the target environment. And I'll get through to these. Um, so an entry point is any part of the application that um, deserializes data. So if we're looking at network traffic or if we're looking at files that an application reads, um, you can identify serialized data by the, uh, the magic number and the version number. You want, ideally you want five bytes to identify a serialized stream. Excuse me. Um, like I said, the header and then a byte in the range 70 to 70 because that's a valid serialization stream. So, got some data there that's clearly not plain text in Burp Suite. We click on the hex view and you can see there ACED 0005 Again, same thing, Wireshark, start of that packet. Um, basics for encoded serialization data. So, uh, in, for example, a web application where, where, where we're working with a text based protocol, um, binary data is not very, it's not, it's not very nice to use, not very, it's not really um, compatible with a text-based protocol. So we might basics for encode the data, which produces a recognizable pattern. Um, so if you, see, if you see a cookie or a, um, a HTTP header that, ca that starts off with lowercase r, capital O, zero, and then capital ABX, then that's the serialization header. Um, so, when we're looking at some uh, at serialized data, the Java serialized data, um, there are another uh, a handful of other indicators that tell us that this is definitely serialized data. First thing is Java class names. You'll see this this sort of stuff through the data. So, sun dot reflects dot annotation dot annotation invocation handler, com dot foo dot a, so on. There's also an alternate format format for that, and that's down to the serialization. Um, data format. It's, it's just, uh, I, I don't know the exact reason for it, but in certain places the class name will be in a slightly different format. So it'll begin with a capital L, end with a semicolon, and then instead of dots in between um, the parts of the namespace and the actual class name, it's forward slashes. And then another bit that, that stands out, for, again, from the format of the, uh, of the, the, from the screen format, You'll see strings like SR and XP throughout it. Throughout. So SR tells us this is an object and this is a class defin d d description. Seven, hex 73, hex 72. Um, XP is seen towards the end of a class description. It tells us that uh, this is the end of the class annotations and this, uh, this class has no, um, has no parent class. Um, so that's CC end block data. That's uh, the content type is end block data, and then content type null for those. Um, so, looking back at that login packet, we can see all these indicators. Um, so we've got SR, Java class names, XP, but there's no ACED 0005. Um, and the reason for that is, uh, so this is this was the first of the login packets that I actually saw in Wireshark when I was testing that application. And the reason for there being no ACED0005 is that that's a stream header that only appears right at the very start of a serialization stream. So what this application did was, it, when you started it up, it connected to the server and used an object input stream, object output stream to, to read and write over that connection. 
at that point, the serialization header goes in each direction. And then subsequent packets contain, don't, don't contain that header because we've already opened the stream, we've already started the stream. Um, and an interesting point here, this client had an IDS in place, um, which had rules to detect these kinds of attacks, but it looked for those bytes and some additional bytes in the packet, in the same packet. Because my payload went over the network at a later point, my attacks went completely undet undetected. So don't rely on seeing the header. It should be there at the start of the stream, but if you see data that's a bit further into the stream, then you're not going to see it straight away. So once we've, we've identified an entry point, we need to work out where to actually inject our payload. Um, so the simple case is that we will see the serialization stream header, and it will be followed by a byte in either of these three ranges, so 70 to 76 or 7b to 7e. Each of those, uh, all of the bytes in those two ranges are content elements, serialization stream content elements that can be read as an object. So if you call object input stream dot read object, you can read any of those content types. So ones that aren't in those ranges, it won't, won't read them. So there is some validation going on. Um, so if we see that pattern in a serialization stream, then we can replace the fifth byte onwards with a payload, an arbitrary object. And when that stream gets passed to the target, it will read the header, and it will start to instantiate an object, which is the object we put in the stream. Once that object's instantiated and returned from object input stream dot read object, there might be an exception from something, there might be an error somewhere. But at that point, our object has already been instantiated in memory, and we've potentially already controlled some code and exploited the application. So it's too late. A common alternative to that is the stream might start with a block data or block data long element. So again, we'll have the stream header, and then we'll have either 77 or 7a. 77 is followed by a single byte, which is the length, excuse me, followed by that many bytes, which are the actual block data. 7a has um, four bytes for the length field, and then that many bytes. After that, if we see a byte in that range, if it all see ranges, then we, re we can replace that byte and onwards with a payload, and we can inject there. So, got an example here. We've got the header, we've got the version number, uh, the magic number, the version number, 7.7, seven, so we've got block data, 08, eight bytes long, eight bytes of block data, and then that 7.3 is in those one of those two ranges, so we can actually replace that 7.3 onwards with any object we want, and pass this data to the target application, and it will instantiate our object, or attempt to. So, more complex cases than those. Um, I wrote a tool for this because I've spent ridiculous amounts of time manually decoding serialized streams of data and working out what all the different things are and where exactly I can inject a payload. So, serialization dumper.jar. We run it and just pass the bytes of a serialization stream, or we can input a file. Um, and it will attempt to pass that into a more human-readable human form. And what we're looking for in here is, again, those, those two byte, range, byte ranges, so 7.0 to 7.6, I think, and then 7b to 7e. And as we can see in the, on, in, on the contents, the first one is a string element, 7.4, so we can actually replace from the start with an object of our choosing, and it will be instantiated. Um, that tool is on GitHub, I've got details of that a bit later on. Essentially we're looking for a content element that's got, uh, that, that's of the type 7.0 to 7.6 or 7b to 7e. We can replace that with any object we want then. So we've got an entry point, we need to find some pop gadgets that we can use. 
Um, like I said, we need source code really to find pop gadgets. Um, you're looking for read object methods and you're looking for the code in those methods, how you can manipulate that based on the data that's been read from the stream, the properties of the object, that current class. And we're looking for object input stream dot read object and code that interacts with the return value. Any of that code we can manipulate using the properties of that object. But that's not very practical. We don't always have source code. And I'm talking about practical attacks. So, like I said, why so serial? If, if, if there are, there's loads of common libraries that are used by loads of applications. Um, Commons Collections is, is one of the most commonly known. Um, and loads of applications are still using it. It's still, I would say, the most common um, vulnerable library for, for this kind of stuff. Um, so, ideally, we'll have some background information on the application, or we'll have an information disclosure that will give us some idea of what libraries are in use. And we can just go, right, that's a vulnerable library, fire the, the correct payload at it, and <coughs> we win, hopefully. Um, if we don't have that information, we can kitchen sink it, <laughs> which is uh, throw everything but the kitchen sink at it. So we've got YSO serial, it generates all these different payloads for all these different libraries, throw them all at it. Um, so, like I said, YSO serial has got a load of payloads for different libraries. That's just a, a, an example. If we, if we know that any of these libraries are in use, the, the, the jar files on the left, then we can use the payload on the right. Some of these overlap, so um, I think there's a Commons Bean Utils payload that re relies on Commons Collections being present. Um, so that might not be so, so useful, but um, so like I said, kitchen sink in anyway. There, I've got a Python script which I've used quite a few times to, to pop this kind of stuff. Just got a list of Wessel serial payload types, loop through them, and we we, ex we, we, we call Wessel serial to generate a payload that generates the, the serialized object that will execute a given command using one of these pop gadget chains, so that, the comments collections one, for example. We then call fire payload and we pass those bytes to that method. Fire payload will do whatever it needs to do to deliver that payload to the application. So you might have to um, fire a certain sequence of packets over the network and then inject the payload into the stream into, you know, over the network. Um, but that's potentially risky. If we're firing a load of random data and objects at, at an application, we could crash it. Um, I've never seen this happen, um, the application would likely fall over if you just m mapped it, um, if, if it was going to fall over because of this. So it's probably not that bad, um, it's because any, any strange data going over the network and hitting this port would probably cause it to crash if it's, if it's not able to handle this. Um, it's definitely noisy doing that, because we're going to generate multiple packets, different payloads, fire them all over the network. Um, and the, the other issue is that it's that we're, we're doing blind command execution with these payloads. We don't know that the pop gadget chains and, and the libraries are present, or which ones, if we're going to just fire all the different payloads. So we might fire 10 different payloads at an application, and um, we might see that the, the, the server starts pinging us or something, if that's what the payload that we're using which one actually um, caused that to happen. Um, and the other thing is, we might find nothing's happening, nothing seems to be happening. Um, is the payload command that we're trying to use actually available on the server? Is the server, uh, is there actually, actually some good firewalling in place that's stopping traffic from reaching us when we've, we've executed a command? We don't know. So. Ideally, we want some feedback from the application. Like I said, you might ping yourself. Firewall might stop that. Um, if you do try that, make sure that you limit the ping count. When I did this, I got a bit excited and I forgot to do that. So I 
maybe 10 processes constantly pinging my box until I manage to get on the server and, and kill them off. Um, but actually, a better option is to try an invalid command. Um, generally, why you, when, you, when you're attacking these kind of issues, you'll, you'll at least get exceptions back over the network. I don't think I've seen a target yet that didn't send a, an exception back. Now, we use an invalid command, um, then we'll get an exception. IO exception that says cannot run program. So if we run XYZ, XYZ, and that's not present on the server, we'll get that. So we can confirm that the payload chain, the pop gadget chain that actually triggered that, is, is available to the server. If the pop gadget chain isn't available, then we'll get um, a class not found exception because we've sent an object of a class to the server. The server's attempted to instantiate an object of that class and it doesn't know what the class is, so it's gone, I don't know, class not found, there you go. Um, so we can fire a single payload with an invalid command and we can find out whether the pop gadget chain is usable and also, um, well, we're using that same technique, we can find out if the command is available, sorry. So, Next thing, payload commands. There's a few quirks with this. Um, like I say, we've got blind command execution if we've got an entry point and we've got some pub gadgets that work. Usually we want to turn that into a shell, we want more access to the server, we want a nicer way to interact with the server and then pivot to, to other systems. So, first thing that we might do is try and enumerate commands that are avail available in the target environment. Same technique that I just mentioned, if we get a IO exception saying cannot run program, then we know that the pop gadget chain is available, but we also know that that command isn't available. Um, there, there are some limitations to the payload commands that we can use. Um, so these, these pop gadget chains in MySource Serial use java.lang.runtime.exec with a single string parameter. And what that does is it takes that string, splits it on the space character, and then the first is the, the, the first item in that array in the result is the command to execute and the rest of the parameters to that command. That means that we can't use white space in parameters to that command. So for example, we can run this command, you can see the parameters to that command are different colours, and we can't use this command because we've got spaces in between, and the, the, the parameters get split up as, uh, as shown there, with the different colours. We also can't use shell operators, so piping and output redirection. Um, now I'm going to skip over these. Some examples of, of payload commands that we can use uh, on, on Windows as well. But I came across this after the first time I delivered this talk. Payload command ex uh, encoder. Um, and you type in arbitrary bash commands, PowerShell, Python, Perl, and it encodes those commands so that you can use them with runtime.exec. Um, so we just take out the bottom and we can execute whatever commands we want, hopefully. Windows without PowerShell is obviously a bit more difficult, but we, we can probably do that. So we've got all these things now for, for an attack. We've um, got a couple of case studies. So the first one, um, Spring Framework um, has, a, has a feature called HTTP remoting, well remoting generally, but there's, there's a HTTP version, there's other versions of it. Um, and what this allows us to do is expose arbitrary Java classes over HTTP. Um, that's facilitated by the Spring Remote Invocation class. Um, so essentially, what we do is we, we, we do some configuration stuff with Spring Framework and we say, right, this class is going to be exposed over HTTP Remoting. Um, on the client side, we can then we, we, we do similar configuration. We say, right, I want 
an object, I, I want this object. And Spring does some magic in the background and it goes, if we call a method on that object, Spring will file that off over HTTP to the server where it will decode a re remote invocation object, um, call a method, get the result and send it back. That's done in the, in the body of a HTTP POST request. And it looks like this. Or this. So that's our entry point. Literally just the body of a POST request. We put any serialized objects in there and the server, Spring HTTP Remoting, will deserialize it. Um, so this is an extension to the script that I showed earlier where we're we're looping through different payload types. Fire payload just does a post request using the um, Python request library. It also checks for the class not found exception and tells us if that um, pop gadget chain is supported or not. Um, yeah, so using that, you can pop Spring Framework, Spring HTTP remote in. That shouldn't happen though. Um, the problem here is that I'm sending a hash set object to Spring Framework in the body of this post request. Spring Framework is deserializing a hash set, but it wanted a remote invocation. I should have sent a remote invocation object, but it, it just deserialized it anyway. Um, the hash set object that I sent isn't compatible with the remote invocation type compatible and so an exception gets thrown and the object that I send to the server never reaches the application that's using Spring HTTP remoting um, because Spring Framework itself can't cast it to remote invocation. But according to Pivotal who makes Spring Framework, it's not an issue with Spring Framework. Go figure. Um, the uh, the guy on the Spring Security, the Pivotal Security team that I reported this issue to, has a CVE number for reporting a very similar issue in I think JBoss, um, and, and he still thinks that this isn't an, uh, an issue with Spring Framework. As an application developer, you can't, you won't ever see that payload. Second case study: Acme Money. Obviously, that's not what it's called. Can't reveal the name at the minute. But it's where that Dan login packet was. Um, so, exploitation was a little bit more involved this time, still easily done, and that script can still do it quite easily. So, I spotted serialization data in the stream. You can see that quite clearly there. So, like I said, I didn't see ACEB0005. So, I restarted the application, fired up Wireshark. And I, that, sorry, closed the application down, fired up Wireshark, restarted the application, and I captured the full um, communication. And actually, it was quite simple. It was just an initial packet went out to the server, response came back, another response came back, and then, like I said before, you're looking for a byte in one of these two ranges, so 7.3 in that second outbound packet, that's the injection point. Oh, sorry, so, yeah, I've highlighted that stuff. So, something to point out here. This very first packet, the following bytes, they were static every single time I did this. So I knew that I could just send that same packet, replay that same packet to the server. So as we can see, we've got fire payload method from that same Python script, a similar, you know, copy of it. We connect to the target. We send that first packet that's static every single time. We receive two packets from the server, don't care what they are, just chuck them away. And then we send the payload. And the reason for the square brackets for colon is the stream header was already sent there, ACED, so on. So that payload contains the stream header, so we just trim that off and we send the rest of the, the objects, the payload object. So through this script together, based on the packet capture. I fired it at the server, found out that it was running, it was using Commons Collections 3.2.1 and got 
command execution. Got quite a lot of command executions actually. Um, so at this point, I've proved that I'm executing commands on the server, and you could say that's you've you won. Um, but I think this is a good example of, of what you can do with this kind of issue. And this, this it's there's loads of big enterprise applications that have this kind of issue. Um, so I'm going to carry on. Obviously, I wanted a shell. So I used a technique that I've talked about to find valid commands on the server. I tried netcat, wget, curl, getting the, the command didn't exist. I found that Perl was on the server. At the time, I wasn't aware of the payload encoder that I mentioned. So at this point, I thought, well, I can't easily write a file because I can't echo and output, redirect output to a file, for example. If I want to do a Perl shell one-liner, I've got to use socket, so I need a space in the parameter to Perl. So it's, I can probably use it somehow, but I'm going to see what else there is. So I've, I've fiddled around, eventually found that the server had a TFTP command available, a uh, quick Python script, set, a direct, set up a directory as a TFTP server on my box, and I had access to the file system then. I could download stuff from my box, I could upload stuff to the, to the server. Um, so I got a shell on the server and realised that, uh, well, firstly, this is the first, ever, first ever time I'd found, I'd come across an AI, AIX box. Um, I do mostly application testing and code review. First time coming across one of these and that's probably why it was a bit funky with commands, but it was also outdated because obviously operating system patches don't matter. Um, and so I found a privilege escalation exploit. I thought, awesome, I'm done, I'll get root on this box. But the uh, exploit was written in C, and I didn't have build tools available on the box. But I did have Perl, so I rewrote that exploit in Perl. It was painful, but it was worth it because I got root on that box. And then, like I said, from there, I jumped around the entire network. I had Unix admins running out from when they got alerts that someone had logged onto the production servers. It was like, it wasn't me. So, like I said, it's, I, I'm talking about practical serialization attacks. These aren't as practical as other attacks, they're not, they're not as easy to do. But I wrote some tools that hopefully make it a bit more practical. So, the first one, Serial Brute. This is basically that script. Um, Serialbrew.py will replay a HTTP request or a, um, a, a TCP conversation and will inject a payload at some point. And it will brute force through the payloads and allow it will stop at each one and say, was it successful? Because ideally you don't want to be spamming all these different payloads. It will also try and detect the um, exceptions coming back and it will tell you, this payload's no good, this one's no good. That one might be useful. Um, it's not meant to be a robust attack tool. It's, it works for most cases. If you have to do something like um, get a session ID from the server and then replay that in a, further, in a later packet, it's not going to do it. But for that, there's another version, um, SRL BRT.py, which you basically implement your dispatch payload method, do whatever you want to do there. So, like, like I did before, replay the first packet, read two packets back and play the pay, replay the payload, or send the payload. Serialization dumper.jar, release that as well. So if we've got some serialized data, we can just pass it through this. It will dump it out in a more human readable form, and we can find a point in that stream where we can inject a payload. Um, yeah. And then lab, whatever you want to call it, however you want to pronounce it, it's, it's just a demo application, client and server. It does something similar to this application, this Act Me Money application, um, but you can use that to actually just try the tools out and see, see how this works and see if you can exploit something like this. Um, so I was going to do a demo, but I think I'm out of time, so I also didn't sacrifice the goal. Um, any <laughs> yeah, conclusion and any questions? It, 
it's, it's built into Java. It's just easy to use. You don't have to do. You don't have to have an extra library in there. There's no, you know, no dependencies. You just implement this interface and you go. So that's it's, it's easy. That's that's it basically. Um, so I know that there are JDK, JDK 7 and JDK 8 pure Java gadgets, but for very, very old versions of the JDK. Um, it's, you have to really dig into the code. There's some really good researchers that have done loads of work in this area. Um, it can be quite time consuming. Some people have built tools that help to find gadgets, but um, there have been gadgets that work just purely using JDK. Yeah. JDK.